This is Harry Murray at Murray's Fly Shop in Edinburgh, Virginia. Today we're going to talk about fishing for smallmouth bass with the Helgramites and the Mad Toms. These are both very, very important foods in the smallmouth diet, and we have patterns that we use that match these very closely. You'll see my son Jeff holding a smallmouth there that he caught on the North Fork of the Shenandoah River on one of the Murray's Helger mites. So we'll touch base on this, and if you have any questions, you can ring us back. The picture you see on the left is the natural Helger mite. This is the larva of the Dobson fly. He lives on the stream bottom for three years, so they're always there. Not like the mayfly nymphs that hatch today and they're gone. But there are always a lot of those Helger mites in the stream. The bass feed on them year round. They're especially productive for the big bass. Just prior to hatching into the Dobson fly, they'll be almost four inches long. When I was a kid, we used to sane them with a homemade sane and catch dozens of them in the Stony Creek and in uh, the North Fork of the Shenandoah River. Now, the pattern you see on the right, that's the Murray's Helger mite. It took us a long time to come up with that. Fortunately, with the help of Charlie Brooks out in West Yellowstone and and Ron Comer, we came up with patterns that do mimic it. Where the stumbling block had been on the existing patterns that we kept using and using, using and not catching fish was that when that Helger mite that you see on the left, if you would pick him up from under a rock, drop him in the stream, he's going to swim downstream with a very pronounced undulating motion. That was the motion we couldn't come up with with these rigid patterns we'd been using. I had uh, the boys out in Montana tie some of their oversized nymphs for me and they didn't work. I've got the most expensive things Abercrombie and Fitch in New York had and they didn't work. But finally on hitting with this ostrich arrow and the tying it in the round the way Charlie Brooks wanted to do, we came up with a pattern that could swim very, very effectively upstream, downstream, across stream. It makes no difference. You can take them on that pattern. When that Helger mite that you just saw on the left reaches maturity, he becomes what we refer to as the Dobson fly. That fly will fly up under these limbs and lay these eggs that you see there and then these eggs will drop into the stream and hatch and I suppose you're seeing maybe a thousand Helger mite eggs there and they'll drop in the stream and then start that three, uh, three year cycle all over again. But it's real interesting to see these. We usually see them in June and July and they are very, very prolific. This angler is at a perfect location to fish the Helger mite water that's above him and beside him. That water that you see straight up in front of him is loaded with Helger mites. That's the kind of place we used to go with the sane and sane them out in great numbers. His first cast would be sort of in that area. Now, this is what we would call upstream dead drift nymphing. He's relying on the indicator that we incorporate into our bright butt leader. He'd cast up in there and let it drift back naturally. That's what the dead drift nymphing means. He's drifting back, not imparting an action to it, but watching the indicators very closely to detect the strike. Then he's going to maybe cast right over in there and do the same thing again. He's going to cast right up under that ledge, let it sink down, and then drift back down toward him naturally. Another cast would be just a little further. He'd repeat that all the way across the below that ledge. 
there are hundreds and hundreds of helger mites in there, and heavens knows how many bass there are in there feeding on them. But that's the upstream dead drift nymphing. Charlie Brooks taught us all how to do this a long time ago, and it is just as effective today as it was at that time. Now, option number two for my friend, he can come back and still stay in, in that same spot. He can cast up into that corner, right in through there. Now, here he's going to use what Brooks calls swing nymphing. Actually, I call it swing nymphing. Charlie had a more elaborate name for it. But he taught me to do this on the Yellowstone many years ago. He'd cast right up in there. Then with the rod tip held way up in the air, he would let that uh, the, his artificial helger mite drift right down where you're seeing the little pointer go. Now, in this case, he is actually trying to feel the strike. This is an easier technique than the upstream dead drift nymphing. Might not get quite as deep with it, but that's the swing nymphing. And he could cover that whole area over there with the swing nymphing, which would enable him to feel that strike. So between the upstream dead drifting and the swing nymphing, he's going to show his helger mite to every fish out in there. All right, the photo on the left is the sculpin mena. When I was a kid, we called them spring mena. We seined them in the river. We fished with them for bait, and they were all over the river in the fastest part of the stream. That's that's where we'd seen them. Now, the fly on the right is the Murray's Mad Tom Sculpin. I developed that to sort of look like that, and we do it in several different colors. But the natural Sculpin mena is a bottom-hugging mena. They're not schooling menas, but where we'd turn up a seine, where we find one, we'd find another half dozen at least, and maybe a dozen. This angler is going to cover all of that water below that ledge with his Mad Tom Sculpin imitation. There are Sculpin minnows everywhere down through there. The first thing he would do is wade over into this side, right in that area that you see the pointer. From there, he's going to cast across right under. See, he's thinking that those minnows are lying closely under that riffle, which they are. And he's going to strip it back across there, maybe six inches every five seconds to swim it across and he'll cover that whole area doing that. After he covers that, he would probably walk over to about where he's standing right there. And he would continue this technique by casting across up all, he would cover all that with his flies and gradually wade over in that area. And he would cover all of that with his, his flies Again, stripping them right across the bottom. After he would catch all those fish, he'd come back to probably about where he is standing now. And his cast would go across stream right tight against that ledge. And he would strip it back real slowly right along the bottom. Pick that up. The next cast would be maybe two or three feet further downstream. And he would continue that with another cast a little further down. And he would cover all of that. Every piece of water you see there holds those minnows. And a good fisherman would catch a lot of fish out of that. We teach a whole lot of this in our schools. It's very important in this situation to keep the rod tip pointed where the line is coming out of the water so you can feel that strike. You only have a second or second and a half to detect that strike and set the hook and you've got him. But that water is loaded with sculpins. When you see it, you devote an adequate amount of time to it. The rod that you see in the right is typical of the rod I use for all of my smallmouth fishing and the rods we use in our classes. 
we use nine foot seven weight rod because of the size of the fly. These are big flies. You're not going out there with a tiny trout fly. You could throw on a five weight rod that you would get in trouble. These are seven weight rods throwing those big flies. Now the leader in this is extremely important. This is the one that we developed a long time ago called the Murray's Bright Butt Leader. We incorporate two pieces of fluorescent amnesia in the butt of that and then put the Murray's indicator in there. The whole purpose of this leader is to give us a good understanding of when we're getting that strike, second, second and a half, and zap, you've got him. So the leader really is quite critical when you're doing the two types of smallmouth fishing we're talking about. We teach this in the school. We teach it in the winter classes about how to construct all these. But during the schools that we conduct here on the stream, we're showing you how to use these leaders and how to catch the bass. I've written several books on fly fishing for smallmouth bass. They provide a good understanding and the background information we're talking about in the tackle, the techniques, the natural food that's available to them. With this type of understanding, you have the ability to catch these bass in small streams, large streams, throughout anywhere you find smallmouth bass. I did a show not too long ago up at the Navy Pier in Chicago. After I finished the seminar, the boys came up and said, Harry, what you're talking about is just exactly what we do in this part of the woods up in here. So the books would give you a good understanding, but I'll be glad to discuss it anytime you want to cover it. Just call me at the fly shop here in Edinburgh. This is Harry Murray at Murray's Fly Shop in Edinburgh, Virginia.